Okay, we'll start again. <laughs> so, warmly welcoming everyone to the last event in this year's UCL Institute of the Americas Caribbean Seminar Series. My name is Kate Quinn and I'm Associate Professor in Caribbean History here at the Institute and co-convener of the seminar series along with my colleagues Dr Steve Cushion and Professor Gad Human. Um, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome indeed to everyone, wherever in the world that you're joining us from, and most especially to our panelists who are going to talk to us this afternoon about this wonderful book and project, The Fire That Time, Transnational Black Radicalism and the Sir George Williams Occupation. Um, I'm gonna keep the introductions very brief as I want to maximize the time for our panelists and for the Q&A. Um, but it gives me an enormous amount of pleasure to welcome our four speakers. Nalini Mohabir, who's Assistant Professor in Geography, Planning and Environment at Concordia University, Montreal. Ronald Cummings, Associate Professor in English and Cultural Studies at McMaster University, Hamilton. Amanda Perry, um, Faculty at Champlain College, St. Lambert, Montreal and Ayanna Bob, PhD candidate at the University of the West Indies, Cape Hill, and also graduate teacher in the Ministry of Education, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, so that's gonna be our running order. Um, our panelists will speak for the next 40, 45 minutes, and then we're gonna open it up to the Q and A. Um, but just before I hand over, I just want to really, emphasize what a great book this is, what a necessary book. Um, it's one of those books that you're sort of surprised when you saw it that it hadn't been done before, um, not least given the, the gap in time between this contribution and the contemporaneous account of events in um, Dennis Forsyth's 1971 edited volume on the Sir George Williams affair. Um, it's a book that offers a new perspective on those events and their ramifications and it makes a very important intervention into a whole number of histories, histories of the global 1960s, the connected histories of transnational black radicalism, um, the histories of Canada, the Caribbean and beyond at a sort of critical juncture of black power and other related activism. I could go on, I'll just say buy the book. Um, and I will hand over now to the editors of this very fine collection, Nalini and Ronald. Thanks so much for those kind words, um, Kate. Um, sorry. Let me pull up my text. Okay. Um, yeah, really big thank you, Kate, for this invitation. Um, and thank you as well to the organizers of UCL's um, Institute of the Americas Caribbean Seminar Series for hosting us. Um, Canada is often overlooked in some of the thinking about the Caribbean diaspora, so we're really pleased to be here and to be part of this series. And we also want to thank the audience for joining, joining us today uh, by Zoom. Um, you know, there are much better things that you could be doing, uh, well, well, many other things you could be doing um, on a sunny day such as this um, here in here in Toronto. Um, so we were invited to speak about uh, this volume, The Fire at That Time, Transnational Black Radicalism and the Sir George Williams Occupation. And I want to say that this work not only commemorates and remembers a history of collective struggle, um, but is also informed by a practice of collectivity uh, in its form and its in its offering of a chorus of voices uh, towards a project of remembering. And so the form of the anthology for us um, was uh, an important um, tool in sort of collecting this history. Nalini and I are editors, but we note that this volume is evidence of collective remembering across borders. And so we're happy to have Amanda, who's based in Montreal, joining us, but also Ayana, uh, who is based in St. Vincent, uh, who's joining us today uh, to further our understandings of the implications of Black student protest. Following two weeks of a peaceful sit-in, on February 11th, 1969, the riot police stormed Montreal's Sir George Williams University, which is now Concordia University, in the smoke and heat of a devastating fire in the computer center. They assaulted and arrested nearly 100 people trying to escape the blaze. 
Black and international students from the Caribbean attending Sir George Williams University had been protesting their experiences of discrimination and the university's failure to take seriously their complaints about racism on campus. And they had done this by occupying the computer center for two weeks. This pivotal moment of protest is, tempor is temporarily linked to student organizing at various institutions across the world, such as the protests in 1968 at Duke University, uh, as well as Brown University, San Francisco State, uh, and May 68 in France, the student protests in May 68 in, in France. Um, it is also connected to protests in 1969 at UCLA, at Cornell University, and at Brandeis as well as resistance that happened in the Caribbean around um, what is tight, you know, generally called the Walter Rodney uh, riots in Jamaica, which happened in 1968 after Rodney was banned um, by the Jamaican government from re-entering the country after attending the Congress of Black Writers in Montreal. This moment is also linked, this protest is also linked to Trinidad's Black Power Revolution in 1970, and central to that was NJAC, the National uh, Joint Action Committee, which was formed by students at University uh, of the West Indies in 1969. Also, according to Kamau Brathwaite, the Montreal protest was part of the lead up to the 1970 occupation of the Creative Arts Center at the University of the West Indies, Mona, where students were demanding um, that the sort of cultural content um, facilitated and hosted and produced by the center reflect uh, their social um, relations um, and histories. This moment also coincides with other historical shifts that mark the pivotal decade of the 1960s. These include the opening up of Canadian immigration policy uh, to people from the global south, the wider context of human rights struggles, uh, including uh, the women's movement, queer rights activism across North America, and the 1960s independentist movements in Quebec and elsewhere across the world. The independentist and broader political uh, climate of the time meant that the fut that future political leaders were also part of this protest. For example, Senator Anne Coules in Canada and Rosie Douglas, the late Prime Minister of Dominica, were student leaders in the protest. Dalil War Warrell, who would go on to become the governor of the bank uh, of the Central Bank of Barbados, and whose writing in 1971 would explicitly name some of the colonial and neo-colonial ties of Canadian economic interest to the Caribbean, was also present in Montreal 1969. And we note these markers as one way of positioning this protest at, at the crossroads of histories and futures. 50 years after the protest, a collective of Black and Caribbean scholars and community members organized in 2019 to mark the 50th anniversary of the Sir George Williams student occupation. Um, and to find out more about this, um, there's a website that we produced as part of the lead up to this titled uh, Protest and Pedagogy CA. And we'll just drop the link um, in the chat uh, because it has an archive um, of the range of events that took place over uh, those two weeks. The 2019 commemorations out of which this book emerges sought to reflect on how the Sir George Williams University occupation might be meaningfully considered in relation to the radical 1960s and the transnational legacies of Black radical thought and activism, as well as what it means to make demands on a university through a practice of occupation. Key questions about the legacies of the Sir George occupation have been posed in David Austin's important book, Fear of a Black Nation, Race, Sex and Security in 1960s Montreal. In a passage which recalls a dialogue between himself and the Pan-African activist, Alfie Roberts, Austin suggests that, quote, Sir George made the point that black people were not willing to lie low in the face of oppression and discrimination, end of quote. Yet while he acknowledges the spirit of resistance as an important political outcome of the event, he also at the same time refuses any easy romantic idealization of the protest, suggesting that questions need to be asked regarding what relationship the did the protest have to any broader movement or what was their vision and how could it have made the transition from an occupation to a broader movement? Austin suggests that stripped off the romanticism that often surrounds the incident, the memories of Sir George are instructive in terms of how we might come to understand the immense challenges involved in political work and building a movement. 
So Austin's pivotal question of what was their vision is indeed a useful one. And in today's reflections, we don't aim to definitively answer this question because it's a broad one. However, we hope to clarify some of the stakes of the students' actions, as well as some of the afterlives of this protest, and to think about the disruptive potential of student resistance and Caribbean resistance beyond the primary framework of Black nationalism in which Austin's work is invested. So in our introduction to this volume, The Fire of That Time, uh, we suggest that this specific history of protest might be, con uh, might be connected to a longer past and to to wider geographies through an attention to the symbolism, materiality, and meaning of fire. So rather than reading Canada within a geography of snow, how might an attention to the Sir George Williams University fire, as well as a longer history of fire connected, for instance, to the hanging of an enslaved woman, Marie-Joseph Angelique, for the alleged burning down of old Montreal in 1734, allow us to examine Canada's place within an interconnected geography of fire, that is, ne a networked geography of, plantation, of the plantation system that hails a transnational Black radicalism. And in doing so, we offer concepts such as geographies of fire and plantation geographies in the introduction to resituate Canada uh, and this protest within transnational networks of Blackness, which Amanda and Ayana will elaborate on in their uh, comments today. And we also uh, situate Can Canadian universities within colonial networks of race, knowledge, and power. And I'll hand over to my colleague, Nelly. Thank you, Ronald. So continuing on, um, for us, a plantation is a set of relations shaped by white rule over black and brown bodies whose labor is variously extracted, exploited, and or devalued. Scholars in the UK and the US have drawn on the plantation as a metaphor to describe the epistemological, social, and economic violences within Euro-American universities, including continuing systemic racism and demands for change tamed by committees. We also might note how, in much the same way that the university administration in 1969 sought to manage Black student complaints through delays and deferrals, we might see a continuance with what Sarah Ahmed has theorized as institutional mechanics, that is the quote, policies, procedures, and other non-performatives, unquote, that serve to keep in place structures of power, or what Stuart Hall has described as neoliberal managerialism. In response to the wider protests uh, in the wake of George Floyd's murder three years ago, and the calls for attention to race equity and change in universities, there have been the formation of numerous task forces, committees, and inquiries at many universities. While some of the reports that have been generated by such committees may be useful contributors to change, we also note how little action has been taken in the intervening time to address the stark underrepresentation of Black students and faculty, as well as the apartheid-like divisions between cleaning staff and administrative staff and faculty, and the continuing white-centric ontologies and colonial value systems of the university. Forms of bureaucratic labor often devote significant time to, quote, identifying and documenting the problem, unquote, as Ahmed tells us, but they often defer and in some instances can forestall a stronger commitment to action. The commissioning of inquiries and investigations related to slaveholding legacies of universities have been, I think, more pronounced in the UK relative to Canada. The Roads Must Fall campaign, for instance, has helped to create some of the conditions for critical self-reflection by universities on their connections to slavery and the colonial plantation industrial complex. The founders of Canadian universities have also had significant relationships to the profits of plantations. The material legacies of these connections can be observed in some of the names of buildings um, uh, that adore, and statues that adorn campuses. In addition to these material legacies, the legacies of plantation dynamics are also felt in the number of security incidents that target Black students on campus and serve as a reminder of who can occupy university space and what it means in this era of neoliberal universities to ask, who is the university meant for? However, 
in the Caribbean, the very birthplace of the plantation economy, where the University of the West Indies is located on the site of a former plantation, the university remains the embodiment of national dreams, committed to undoing the damage of colonialism. Yet, as Eric Williams noted in his address to the first graduates of UWE in 1963, quote, the university has benefited from extensive benefactions, friendly foreign governments, and friendly foreign philanthropic foundations. Those we gratefully acknowledge. This must not blind us and you to the fact that we live in a world of nations who have no particular love for you or the West Indies and who place their own interests first, unquote. In other words, the university may embody hope, but is also situated within a complicated set of entanglements at the personal, local, and global levels. For example, Princess Anne remains the royal patron of UE's endowment fund. Deborah Thomas in Political Life in the Wake of the Plantation poses a central question. What does sovereignty feel like? Emphasizing the feeling of autonomy or liberation over bureaucratic functions of national sovereignty. In this context of life in the wake of the plantation, how might we understand the experiences of international students coming from a decolonizing Caribbean to study in Montreal if we were to hold together the longer legacy of forced migration in the Americas and Caribbean migration to Canada in the 1960s to ponder what the quote, problem space unquote of Sir George reveals. When the students in 69 occupied Sir George Williams University, they were dreaming of radical futures, although that was perceived as riotous. What is clear is that they thought the university could change and should be responsive to their needs and to their presence. As we saw during the responses to Black Lives Matter, the university campus remains an important site of protest, simultaneously local and transnational transnational that makes universities a generative site to ponder alternative futures. So we find ourselves returning to this moment in 1969 because the legacies of Black radicalism it presents is not contained within a temporality of the past. Thank you. And I will pass it on to Amanda. Hello everyone, um, and thank you to Nalini and Ronald for the invitation. I viscerally dislike making PowerPoints, so I uh, hope that I will be forgiven for not having one here today. Um, so my contribution to this volume was focused on connections to Haiti and Cuba in the Sir George Williams affair. So today I'll be focusing on Haiti, but I would of course be very happy to discuss Cuba during the Q&A. So I, just for some background, I came to this chapter while working on a larger project concerning the resonance of the Cuban Revolution in Haiti and the Anglophone Caribbean. So I was already very invested in thinking through what kinds of connections managed to cross linguistic barriers um, among the Caribbean militants, writers, and intellectuals. I had also just relocated to Montreal from New York and was deeply infatuated with my new city. Uh, as I was working on this chapter, and both of these factors certainly shaped my approach to this material. Uh, so just as Nalini and uh, Ronald already mentioned this, but you know, 1960s Montreal is a major hub for a wide range of radical activism, um, including, of course, Quebec's Quiet Revolution and the consolidation of an independence movement by French Canadians. This is also a time period where we have a long-standing um, Black Anglophone community with strong Caribbean ties, um, but Montreal is also starting to emerge as a major center for the Haitian exile community that's fleeing the dictatorship of uh, Duvalier. Uh, so 1960s Montreal, and I would say to a large extent, we still say this about contemporary Montreal, also has a reputation for being linguistically segregated. Um, this is that cliche of the two solitudes that some of you may be familiar with. So I was interested in thinking through, you know, to what extent does this cliche apply to these communities of activists as well? Um, and to what degree does Montreal instead emerge as a center for cross-linguistic Caribbean encounters? Um, I'll also turn it near the end here to some more theoretical questions um, in terms of thinking through the tensions between race and class in these Caribbean revolutionary imaginaries. So um, my, discussion of the 1969 protests was largely anchored in an extended interview with Philippe Fils-Aimé, 
I'll just uh, show you a very contemporary picture of him here. So try to imagine him uh, 50 years younger than this. Is this working? Can you see him? All right. Um, so, and I am a, as a young Haitian activist, um, Philippe Fissame joined the organizing committee for the 1968 Congress of Black Writers, and he was among those who were arrested following the 1969 Sir George Williams affair. Uh, we can't, you can't see the picture. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll try it again later. Um, he may have been the only Haitian who was involved in the occupation. He was almost certainly the only one who was arrested. I'll just put a link here so you can have a look at what he looks like. Um, now, uh, I, although I conduct quite a lot of archival research, I'm primarily trained in a, as a literary scholar. So I'm very comfortable with what social scientists might call an end group of one in terms of focusing on Pisa May and his involvement. But I also see him as a, uh, what Laura Putnam might call a telling example um, as his, his life story and his involvement here as a way of thinking through the overlap and the divergence of Anglo-Caribbean and Haitian political organizing within Montreal in this time period. And I would argue that tracing the involvement of a single activist paradoxically expands the scope of these events, um, evoking a transnational context that involves the Duvalier dictatorship, the Vietnam War, and guerrilla training camps in the Bahamas. So uh, if you look in the chat, I think that link should work to seeing, having a look at, at Fisa May. He's um, now, Fisa May is a relatively light skinned Haitian. He described himself to me as a brown kid with greenish eyes uh, from a prominent military and intellectual family. So he's thus self identifies as a beneficiary of a rather complex form of colorism within the Haitian context um, outlined by Michel Rolf Trio, um, within which the Haitian nation is fundamentally conceived of and celebrated as black but lighter skin and European features still can carry a certain form of prestige. Now, following the election of Francois Duvalier in 1957 uh, and his rapid consolidation of autocratic power, the position of families like Fissamés became far more precarious. Um, Duvalier presented himself as a so-called noiriste, a champion of Black Haitians set to retake the country from a light-skinned elite. Uh, and his dictatorship would develop a brutal reputation due to its use of violence, notably not just against the poor, but also against the upper classes and upper class women uh, who under previous Haitian governments were generally spared any forms of reprisals. So within this new political context, um, the Fisame family opted for exile, leaving between 1964 and 1965 to join a growing Haitian community in New York. Shortly after that, a few years after that, um, Visa May received a conscription notice to Vietnam. Um, now he credits his decision not to go to the harrowing stories he was hearing from other soldiers in his own developing political consciousness. Um, so as he put it in our interview, they were going to Vietnam just like they were in Haiti, a reference to the US occupation of Haiti from 1915 to 1934. And he saw no reason to fight, I quote, these folks that look much more like me than them. Uh, so he comes to Montreal before these events as both a, an exile from the Duvalier regime and as a draft dodger. Um, and importantly, because of this time in this state, that reinforces his English. So he's also a bilingual activist uh, who's able to move between different communities. So once he's in Montreal, he's involved in the Caribbean Conference Committee, the Congress of Black Writers, networks of people like Alfie Roberts, Rosie Douglas, CLR James, and he credits his contact with these intellectuals for developing a more transnational perspective. Uh, so another quote from him, I came to understand that, hey, we are in an empire, Haiti's not just a special case. There are people in Africa, there are people everywhere who are just fighting against this kind of domination. At the same time, he discusses um, Haitian activism in the city as far more radical than things that were going on within the, the um, Anglo-Caribbean community and things of, of things of which these Anglophones were largely unaware uh, because the goal of Haitian activists in this time period is really to launch an armed offensive against Duvalier to orchestrate a Cuba style overthrow of the state. Um, I am adding Philippe's name to the 
and so they so before um leaving for from the united states to canada fisa may had himself considered going to the bahamas um, where training camps with rather murky sources of funding had been established to plan an invasion of Haiti. Um, and so as, as he put it, you know, the priority in our lives was to go into these camps, was to train to invade Haiti. Um, and the 1960s would see numerous unsuccessful attempts to overthrow the Duvalier dictatorship through guerrilla warfare, most involving small groups of mil militants who were then killed by state forces. So for Haitian exiles in Montreal, obviously revolution is a lot more than just a word. Um, and the city itself would have functioned as one hub for these clandestine networks in ways that have not been fully documented and that would be very difficult by their very nature to fully document. So against this backdrop of militancy, Pisame is actually initially quite skeptical of the student efforts to protest racist pedagogical practices um, at Sir George Williams. He said that he had initially dismissed the matter as a bunch of petite bourgeois students who wanted to have better grades. Uh, he later, however, saw this as a major opportunity, um, a consciousness raising moment, a, rev a sort of rev emerging revolutionary situation um, and became uh, quite closely involved in the occupation with a certain amount of caution as well, um, because of course he could not afford to be deported to Haiti of all places. Um, now he's most well known for one of his actions during the trial of the students after this massive protest. Um, so in our interview, he often stressed his fondness for psychological tactics, uh, including a tendency to adopt an exaggerated hypermasculine stance to establish authority. Um, but his most famous use of a psychological tactic was during the trial, um, inspired by the U.S. activist Jerry Rubin, where he um, made a voodoo doll for one of the prosecutors. Uh, so some of the security guards had apparently been using the search procedures for protesters to enter the courtroom to uh, as an opportunity to grope the women protesters, and this led to a skirmish uh, during which uh, Fisa May recalls one of them saying to him, Osti de maudit voodoo, which he translates as you fucking voodoo boy. Uh, and this was a moment of inspiration for him where he's like, oh, voodoo, that means something to these people. Okay. Uh, so he made a Hollywood style voodoo doll with a white sheet attached a black cape so that it would re resemble a prosecutor. He added a little bit of his own blood to it, smuggles it into the courtroom. Um, and presents it to the prosecutor, uh, saying to him, you know, in Haiti, we have a lot of respect for prosecutors, and we feel obliged to express our respect by bringing you this special gift. Um, if he's a amazing character, and his, his, his description of this event, I cite it at length in the chapter. It's, it's pretty funny, uh, because he just describes the courtroom erupting into a form of chaos. Um, the prosecutor becoming really white, like pure white, his eyes popping out, these guards jumping on him, the judge wanting to charge him with something, but all the laws against witchcraft had been struck down at this point. Um, and he also describes the peop other various people, particularly white people in the courtroom, suddenly becoming afraid of him. Um, and as he, as he said, I was standing there in front of the judge and enjoying it. Frankly, I was just enjoying it because I had never had in my life such a feeling of power. Uh, he recalls being chastised over the phone by his sister, who worked on Wall Street for giving the family a bad name, supporting stereotypes about Haitian culture, and receiving a very mixed reaction from other protesters. Um, mentioning Dougley, Rosie Douglas and especially Ann Cools did not really approve of his tactics here. Um, but he himself remained convinced that this moment didn't hurt their cause uh, and made visible a latent fear of foreigners that had already been present in Canadian and Quebecois society. Um, now, obviously, um, Fisame's story is compelling in and of itself, uh, but I would argue it also draws our attention to the significance of bilingual activists and intellectuals in forging connections between communities that are often separated. Um, I, and I think it raises some broader issues in relation to thinking about Black power movements in the Anglophone Caribbean in relationship to Haiti. 
so during the 1960s, the Haitian Revolution becomes a major touchstone for anti-imperial and anti-colonial movements and rhetoric as source of inspiration. Obviously, I'm thinking of here of people like CLR James and his 1963 appendix. But how do we square that symbolic role of the Haitian Revolution with the existence of the Duvalier dictatorship at the same time? Um, so when James comes to discuss the Haitian Revolution at the Congress of Black Writers in Montreal in 1968, you know, he, he, he talks about it as this example of who are the African people in the Caribbean today and what they are capable of. The first person to respond to him is a Haitian audience member who launches into an attack of Duvalier, um, describing him as being Black, culturally speaking, a lot of shit about the cultural aspect of Black cow power while also supporting white American capitalism. Uh, and so we can see how the presence of Haitians forces certain kinds of conversations to take place. Uh, and elsewhere at the Congress, you know, James would insist on the fact, and this is a direct quotation, Duvalier is black, the fact that Duvalier is black does not matter at all. Um, and he'd cite him alongside Tishombe from the Democratic Republic of Congo as evidence that black power can itself be oppressive when wielded by a comprador elite. Um, and so Duvalier's rhetorical appropriation of a certain form of blackness really does change the conditions for organizing against him because he is himself claiming to be the heir to the Haitian revolution and to Jean-Jacques Dessalines. So speaking broadly among Haitian exiles in Montreal, you see, you can often see an acute suspicion of race-based politics as a potential form of mystification uh, and a strong investment in various forms of Marxism. And during our interview, um, Fisa May echoes some of this rhetoric, uh, saying it, it's just a white and black thing. How do you explain Duvalier? Um, and he would insist on the Haitian leaders' debts to fascist thinkers. Um, in a similar vein, describing narrow black nationalism as being very close to fascism. At the same time, um, in Montreal, Haitians like Fisa May now find themselves as part of a racialized minority. So even as the Haitian example made him wary of uh, some approaches to race, his time in the city and his contact with these other black activists appeared to have broadened and reinforced his own understanding of himself and of his own racial identity. So as he declares, I switched from a Haitian nationalist fighting against neo-colonialism to a black internationalist who should feel at ease in all struggle. Um, so just, uh, it, so for me, bringing Haiti into this picture has several consequences. It highlights the disjuncture between the Haitian Revolution as a symbol uh, that is being used to encourage various forms of militancy elsewhere and its role as an alibi for an oppressive dictatorship within Haiti itself. Uh, it forces our attention towards questions of economic structures and class and to think about how race-based rhetoric under certain circumstances can also become a tool of populist manipulation. Um, and more broadly, and I think this is a good transition to Ayanna's discussion of St. Vincent, um, it gets us to think about Black power as a transnational movement and intellectual tradition that frequently moves between locations where Black people are in a minority and where they're in the majority, um, with, with at least some of them exercising state power. Uh, so with that said, I am really looking forward to hear what Ayana has to say about St. Vincent in relation to these topics. Good afternoon from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I am Ayana Bobble presenting on the chapter that I would have contributed to the book beside at time. Is everyone hearing me? Yes. <laughs> Lovely. Um, so I'm about to share my screen. I would first of all like to thank um, Ronald and Nalini for um, in including the Vincent and chapter in this um, presentation as, 
I would often say our story is not well spoken of um, regionally, nor is it well spoken of um, internationally. So I am happy for the opportunity to speak at least on our behalf, though small, but at least it's so there. Um, so thank you. With that being said, I will begin my presentation. I'm beginning. <clears throat> So <clears throat> the very first part of my book, my um, chapter speaks of Black power inside the, in the Vincent John context. And on my screen, you will see um, the book by Kate Quinn, Black Power in the Caribbean. Now, um, on a lighter note, this was the book that really pushed me to explore more as it relates to um, Black power, which is a part of my overall PhD thesis. Um, my thesis would um, eventually morph into being named Black, Black Radicalism inside 20, um, 20th century St. Vincent and the Grenadines. But initially it started from this book. Um, as an undergrad student at Cave Hill, I would have had interacted with this text. And while my interaction with the text, I am going through and I'm looking for St. Vincent because it says Black Power in the Caribbean. And I was like, where, so where is the Vincentian story? And I remember after I would have, grad, um, after I would have completed my first degree, um, I was offered a scholarship to do my MPhil in history. And I remember having a conversation with my supervisor and I was saying to, you know, Dr. Earl, I want to look at black poems in, 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 in Vincentian Grenadines because Kate Quinn did not mention anything about it. And I think that our story, because as a child I grew up, hearing about um, Black Power and all of this, my father was involved also. And then of course it moved from there and then it went on. So, and here am I today speaking of Black Power, writing about Black Power in 20th, uh, 20th century St. Vincent. So um, in my research, I would have um, figured out that in the first wave of our movement, our chapter of the movement started in 1968. Initially, the setup of Simmons and the way in which Simmons was structured at the time, um, we were dominated um, politically by white, um, but the majority, the masses were black people. The reality of the situation was that um, the blacks were powerless. Um, even though there were black faces in um, positions of authority, what we recognized was that um, the power, um, they were powerless. So there was, there were people at that time questioning, you know, why am I, even though I have um, my, I am qualified academically, why is it I am not able to get a job in the bank? Why is it that I am not able to own certain amount of land? Why is it that because I, I am qualified in all areas, I have the monies, I have, I have this, I have the, the assets, but I'm not able, I'm only allowed to reach at a certain point. So people started to question um, their position, where they sit, why they sit. And with that, with that questioning going around, um, going around St. Vincent and Grenadine, um, in certain eight pockets in St. Vincent and Grenadine. Um, then came the Walter Rodney riots in Jamaica in 1968. Um, of course, it was mentioned before by Ronald that, um, Rodney would have went to a writer's conference in Spain, Canada, and when he came back, he was not allowed to enter Jamaica. Um, from St. Vincent, taking part in that, in that inside that um, protest was Ralph E. Gonzalez, who is now our prime minister. So he was one of the first, one of the forerunners in that. And of course, persons in St. Vincent would have been hearing, would have been hearing stories, would have been hearing, would have been getting news about. You know, why, um, why is there a protest in Jamaica at the university? And what I would hear stories coming back from um, Ralph E. Gonzalez about what really and truly was happening then. So, of course, that would have started, started some agitation here in St. Vincent and Grenadines. In addition to that, um, then came in 69, the saw George Williams um, University Affair, where we had quite a, quite a few students who were either belonging to the university itself, George, George Williams, or were um, 
attending other um, universities who were, were in the space at that time. So we had persons like Annie Eustace, we had persons like um, Cohen, uh, Morris, Ronnie, John, Alice Roberts, all of these people or Vincentians were involved. So of course, we're hearing news about um, what is taking place, what is happening, and all of this starts to influence further um, persons who are here on the land questioning. And then, of course, we had the um, we had we started to get information in 1970 about the um, the upsurge in Trinidad, the February Revolution. We were getting news via the boats because we, we had a traffic um, we were trafficking stuff, we're trading with them. So we're either reading newspapers, we were either hearing through conversations about what was happening. So these were some of the influences, some of the major influences that started um, to trigger the movement um, in a more organized fashion inside St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, so we see that we have the run rights of 1968, the third George, George, George Williams University of 1969, and the Trinidad of Storage in 1970. Um, following that, we had the students, we had um, we had students returning, and then of course we started. We, uh, we had the formation of local black power groups, and we we uh, what I discovered were were seven groups. Um, I'm not sure if they were more perhaps they were, but these were the seven that, following interviews and, and research, I would have discovered these four, these seven, which is the educational form of people, ESP, the young social socialist group, the organization of black cultural awareness of Black, the Black Liberation Action Committee, are we, um, Ulimo, and the New Rescuers Movement. All of this um, was voted from this, the, the, the Black Power um, ideology. And the EFCM, there's a photo there. Um, the EFCM was launched in, on April 1169, and the, this group was mainly formed um, by students, former students of the University of. Um, some of the students of the University of Sir George Williams. So we had student and um, students returning, were returning. Those who were in Canada at the time also came back and they formed this group. This was the first organized um, Black Power group in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Following that, we had uh, we had the YSG, which was um, leaning towards Marxism. Um, so we have a photo there of Casper London, who is also who is deceased. Um, he, these people came together with their, their, their ideologies about wanting change, wanting um, the masses to um, be eating the same bread as everybody else. Um, then there is the group OPCA, which was a grassroots group as well. It um, more or less was based in Kingstown in, um, in bottom tongue area. So we had Opka being heavily influenced from people returning from Trinidad would have been exposed to the February Revolution. Then we have from out of Opka now, Black came, um, some persons broke away from Opka. Then Black was formed and the people um, adopted more of the style of um, the Black Power movement in America where they had a 10 point agenda and so on. Um, we had persons like in the photograph, we have Wendy Cruz, who is still alive, um, and who did uh, interviews with, with me. So um, these groups, um, Black would have would, would have been reaching, what should I say, the, the, the ghettos. These are the, this is the group that would have been reaching the young boys on the Blacks. Um, in these two groups, Black and Opka, um, they would have introduced um, the, the marijuana. Marijuana was a big part of their recruiting process. Then we have Awi, um, the sole, the sole um, group that was formed in the windward side of the island, which is where I'm from, Awi. A small community, but was very vibrant and was very um, involved in Black power and Black empowerment. In that photograph, there's Oscar Allen, who was, because um, he's far, so he was one of the founding members of that organization. Then. Um, there was a formation of there was a formation of Upka Black YSG. They all came together and formed a political Black Power group. It was more political, no one not so much social, which was formed into you, Lehman. In there, we see a photograph of Kenneth John, who was also a founding father. Now, um, the discourse, the Black Power discourse inside St. Vincent had two binary narratives, which was which was totally different. The colony. So we have those persons who were against Black Power 
And then of course, we had those persons who were for black power. Now, the persons who were against black power, their argument was that, um, you know, if you look at, if you look through the they had a black prime minister at that time, it was uh, Milton Gato, he was a black man, so we had power. So there was no need for all of this rant here about um, black empowerment and so on. However, those who were for black power, um, while they agree that they were um, black men sitting in these, these positions, they were just in positions of authority, but they lacked power. Um, that led on to, while all of this, um, these narratives were going on, the black, black, black intentions were expressing um, black empowerment in different ways. So they were naming their children with African names, they were dressing um, African style dressing, their hairstyles reflected um, Africanness. So they had the clothes and so on going on. They had the grades, um, the names. We had um, we had African names like Kamua, anything African. So that was the expression. That was the expression that was taking place in that period. All of this is pushing back against um, the white dominance that was in the space at that time. And of course, that would have led to um, repression, state activities. So many of our um, founding fathers, those for the, the photos that I've shown before, um, Panel Campbell, Kenneth John, and so forth, would have met some some pushback again as it relates to the state. So uh, they were sorting um, newspapers and other reading materials that were banned. So we know that mention was made of grandmother that came out from Cuba. Um, if you were caught with the grammar, you were, um, it was taken away, you, chances are you would have gotten um, imprisoned. Um, there were instances where if you, you were caught in the street in a group of more than two persons, um, police would pull you over, dispatch the group, or sometimes some ended up being in prison. There was an incident of Castellan and returning to St. Vincent. He went overseas, he came back to St. Vincent, and he had a a book that had the word revolution on it. Um, and because it had the revolution on it, um, he was he was pulled aside and the book was taken away, et cetera, et cetera. Arrest and detention during the 1970s by police became a norm. So people at that time lived um, in fear, especially those who are associated with the movement. Those, if you were known, if your children were associated with the movement, you they were chastised. Um, especially the parents are middle class and they were on the conservative side, they would they tend to be chastised and some were thrown out of the houses, some were um some some children were um no longer no longer um, being recognized as um family members and so on. So um St. Vincent had its own it had its own um twist as it really because our conditions of course, would have allowed our movement, our Black Power movement, to evolve on its own. And like I would have mentioned before, the marijuana association with our, our movement would have also pulled in the what was called, or what eventually became the Rastafari movement. Um, but I will say that though that while the, the, the research does not show or does not speak to a lot, as it relates to women involvement, which I am still trying to see how much I can find. There, there are some materials, but there aren't much as it relates to women involvement in the in the um, Black Power movement. There was one name mentioned, Arlene Han. Um, she not only did she dress dress African, not only did she name her children African, but she became involved um, at public rally rallies. She would have done the speeches. She would have gone around helping to recruit people educating people about um, the movement and what it was about and what it meant to, to be empowered as a Black. Now, Black power um, in St. Vincent and Grenadines had already started on a small scale. You know, we had the ideas, we were questioning things, we were trying to find out why we are, why we are here, not there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, with the external forces of um, the university, the Sir George Williams University so, um, event um, that, that occurred in Jamaica and also that in Trinidad. And it would have really and truly helped us to um, help us to start that formation, that what we call it, that structured formation of our Black Power movement. Thank you.
Thank you so much indeed to all of our speakers. Um, and I think we can see from that whole range of talks just how generative the book is, um, all of the different areas that it raises um, questions about, the issues of collective organizing, of memory, of, um, I like the phrase, the crossroads of histories and futures that the events uh, were located within in the book. It's after lives, the Anglophone, Francophone, um, Hispanic connections, and, uh, you know, just so much more. I guess I should begin with a, with a, a, a mea culpa in, uh, in the light of the, the absence of St. Vincent and the Grenadines from from the book and thank you so much for raising that. It, it reminds me of all of the, the agonies that I went through in terms of being very aware of what wasn't in there as well as what was in there at the time. And I'm so delighted that uh, you took up the challenge um, uh, and that the book in, in a way served its purpose of generating new research uh, into Black Power in the Caribbean. And just by a little way of recompense to say that there is going to be a, what is in effect a Black Power in the Caribbean volume two um, with the University of Florida Press um, uh, that I'm currently in the process of editing. And I can say that there will be two chapters on St. Vincent and the Grenadines in that book. Lovely, lovely. I hope that goes a little <laughs> way to... to uh, <laughs> So um, with that, I guess uh, maybe if I can just um, start off by asking the editors and the, the panel in general um, how the university itself responded to the proposal to do this 50th anniversary event. I was very interested to, to hear that uh, you said that universities in Canada had been less, uh, had done less than British universities in terms of in, uh, engaging with their past, because I'd say in, in the British case, it's still been few and far between and almost done, done reluctantly and in some ways done in kind of contained ways that sort of contain what you're, you know, what they want to, to, to dig up uh, from those kind of engagements. And given that uh, this uh, event at what is now Concordia, um, you know, uh, puts the university in a, in a less than flattering light. I wondered whether um, you had had any, I don't know, pushback, because in, in the UK, uh, those universities that have engaged with these histories ha have been embroiled in kind of culture war pushbacks against the, 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 these histories. So maybe you could say something about that. Sorry, maybe I'll um, address that. Um, it was it was difficult to organize. I think um, the vast majority of our support came from the community and from um, organizing not just um, events in collaboration with community members, but also raising funds within uh, the community. Um, the university eventually supported the 50th anniversary, but um, that was at the last minute. And um, I think once uh, almost all the events were planned and once there was clear, it was clear that there was a momentum, and that there was a history and uh, a memory that remained in the community um, going to allow this event to pass without uh, marking the occasion. Um, that said though, uh, in 2019, there point of those events were to reflect um, well, on, on the events of the past, um, but also to think about, well, you know, what does this mean for the university, for a critical formation of the university in the present? Um, and those conversations were not taken up um, in 2019, but then once the Black Lives Matter protest became global, then there was a moment um, which has led to uh, an apology, which was something that was demanded in 2019 by uh, the protesters um, and by the attendees of uh, the events. It was not given at that time, but uh, following BLM, uh, it was given recently. After, sorry, after two years of a task force um, that started off um, 
with a broad mandate to study anti-Black racism um, at the university. And I think because of the groundwork that was laid in 2019 at the 50th anniversary of the Sir George Williams you know, affair, um, the questions that kept uh, coming back to the committee was, well, you know, how do we reckon with this particular and local and institutionalized history? So then the report um, centered on this history, which led to the apology. Great, thank you very much. If I could just add two more quick things. Um, as part of the events in 2019, one of our keynote speakers, Michael West also raised a question, you know, about some of the gaps in this history um, in terms of not just an apology, uh, but also an inquiry. Um, you know, just in terms of, you know, the university's involvement, some of those questions about who called the police, you know, those kinds of questions. Um, that that hasn't necessarily been taken up in a, you know, in, in a way like there's still questions around the event that I think um, would usefully uh, be addressed. Um, and also to say that, you know, thinking be, beyond just the context of the university, when we put together this whole series of events we applied to uh, Shark, the Social Sciences and Humanities Council uh, mm -hmm. there in Canada, which is the major funding body. And we didn't get any funding for this event from them. Um, so, you know, like much of the fundraising was in community, supported by community uh, towards commemorating um, this, 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 this event. And I, sorry, just uh, because you reminded me, Ronald, um, one of the uh, protesters themselves who was on hand to receive the university's apology um, also uh, noted that um, an apology is only one step in the reparative work that needs to be done. Um, and you know, we would see another step being material restitution um, and that has not been brought up. And just to a follow on question, did the university open up its archives at all? Um, are they accessible to sort of, the, you know, the I don't know, internal discussions of the event from the perspective of the university administration? I think archives are one of those interesting institutional, so university archives are, you know, records of the institution, not necessarily public archives. Um, and to gain access to those archives, so the images that we showed on the slide uh, that um, showed the devastation of the fire, for example, those were images um, that, result, that came about through insurance um, documentation. So those weren't images, you know, from the newspapers and so on. So that's that's the kind of thing you you see the university's concern, which was the concern for loss of property, not the potential loss of lives. Um, and to gain access to those images requires um, the trust of the institution. Um, and a relationship with the archivist uh, that is difficult in settings where uh, even to this day there's you know a few black archivists in Canada who uh, might understand what are in those files and be able to point researchers to it and to understand you know what kinds of questions might be raised um, through that material. So in 2019, we found it difficult to access that material, but um, again, post BLM, it's been easier. Thank you. Um, I'm going to open it up to the floor now. So um, as usual, people can raise their hands, put a type of question to, into the, the chat. Um, I see Gad, you raised your hand. Good. Uh, yes, uh, thank you all for uh, those very interesting presentations. I think Nalini made uh, this comment, but it could be others who respond uh, about the what I think you call the radical futures envisioned by the students. And I was wondering if you could expand on that idea, either you, Nalini, or or, or the others. Um, I could. I don't know if anybody else would like to respond. Maybe Ronald. You can kick us off. Okay. Um, one of the, so the students 
um, were highly organized in 69 and they produced uh, their own media around their demands. And um, in particular, they took over the student newspaper, which is called the Georgian. And uh, there was an issue dedicated to the Sir George Williams occupation. Uh, that newspaper issue was called the Black Georgian, so in recognition of Black power. And in that special issue, the students handed Black studies. Um, that is something that uh, perhaps some of the people here uh, might be surprised to learn is still uh, an ongoing uh, question in the Canadian Academy. So um, Ronald mentioned that we didn't get funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. So Ronaldo Walcott has time and again pointed out that one of the challenges for people um, doing Black Studies in Canada is that it doesn't exist as a category um, to, you know, for, uh, for people who are applying for funding, for example. So um, this Concordia University, for example, is after two years of studying anti-Black racism has put forward a proposal for a minor in Black Studies. So this is more than 50 years after the initial demand from the students. And the students were making um, this call for Black studies um, in, a broad, in a broader sense, I think, than the way it's currently being conceived by the institution. Um, they were asking us to think about um, race and pedagogy, um, given their experiences of discrimination in terms of grading. They were pointing us to think about what um, Black studies might mean in relation to STEM, because uh, a number of the students were enrolled, uh, were pre-med students, so they were actually in the sciences. Um, they also wanted an active involvement in the shape of Black studies and in the admissions process. So we, they were, um, I think, quite radical in their thinking about Black studies. Mm. Yeah, I mean, maybe also adding to that, I mean, one of the things that's interesting uh, to think about um, in looking at the archives is, you know, and, and I think they were quite uh, forward looking in um, documenting what their demands were, um, you know, not just to the university, but in public spaces, right? Um, and, you know, I just think that there was a vision of a more inclusive university, um, you know, that would um engage different kinds of knowledges and epistemologies um you know and i think that's something as you know you know for those of us who work within universities we see our institutions still striving for um you know um that is still an unrealized um demand um and i think you know what's What's interesting to think about in sort of like looking at their demands is that, you know, that they made it in a really matter of factly way. And um, part of this is that they were coming from the Caribbean, which was in, you know, that moment post independence where they were thinking about futures, they were thinking about what freedom, what liberation uh, looked like. Um, and for them, education was part of that, um, you know, that, that, that discussion. Um, I also wanted to say that Amanda was part of planning some of the events in 2019, so I don't know if she wanted to add something around some of the organizing that took place. I mean, I think I would just add um, the extent to which uh, Nalini and Ronald and the organizers deserve a lot of credit um, for bringing these events to the attention of a university that did not want to be recognizing them at that particular time, for bringing in the community, for negotiating, you know, occasional suspicions from members of the community as well, right, um, in relationship to this, um, particularly Nalini coming in as a relatively new faculty member at that time too. I mean, it was, it was actually very impressive, the amount that they put together. There was a full two-week slate of events featuring um, top scholars from Montreal and from elsewhere. Uh, that that and then the book itself as well that they've continued to promote since then and I'm just really pleased to see how the shift that's happened in the broader landscape um, has made the event retrospectively even more successful um, than than it was in the moment. So uh, that's I, I'm glad to have been a small part of that. 
I would also add that I guess with my chapter um, or from that perspective, that not all of the students were students, right? Um, who were involved in the occupation because the late sixties as well, there were this moment of broader radical fervor. So you had people becoming involved who were looking way beyond the university um, in terms of what it is that they wanted to accomplish and who just saw this as um, an opportunity, an opportunity among many. But yes, like but, bravo mm -hmm. to Noreen and Ronald here. Could I, could I just add a, a supplementary part of this, um, a quick one about um, the perception of this from the university? I mean, how this these um, requests or these ideas, um, obviously they were not met positively, but was there any, what, what kind of reaction was there to the, the suggestions you've just described? Black power, studies, that kind of thing. Um, in 1969? Yes, sorry, yes. Um, well, the university, in fact, um, so it started off with a fairly um, localized incident in, uh, in a physiology course um, where that Professor Perry Anderson uh, was accused of discrimination, uh, racial discrimination in his marking. And the university... Uh, as Michael West points out in his chapter in the book, ultimately promoted the professor. Um, and according to some of the um, legal representation, uh, the lawyers who were involved in the student's case that we've since um, interviewed, the university wasn't acting in good faith in terms of um, negotiating with the students. They were basically waiting out the students. And because the students were international students, they were um, in a very precarious uh, and vulnerable moment. The incident actually uh, was taken up in the Canadian Parliament, where politicians called for their deportation, and that was uh, some of the consequences that they faced when they were arrested. Um, so the university was just was sort of waging a war of attrition. Interesting. I see uh, Steve has a question. Yeah, I'm interested in the knock-on effects, if you will, uh, from this in the rest of the Caribbean. Uh, I went to a meeting recently where Jean Small, who was one of the people who spoke, uh, uh, one of the people who, who was acting in support of the, the sitting from outside, uh, spoke. Uh, she's Grenadian and, you know, and so the, I wonder, you know, links are there with the Grenadian Revolution and how did it kind of, uh, this event, uh, play out in the wider kind of movement in the uh, 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 in the rest of the Caribbean. Maybe Ayana, do you want to come in on the St. Vincent and the Grenadines case? And then we can open it up. Um, yeah, I can repeat what you just said. My internet is in and out, so. It's going in and out. So yeah, if you can just repeat what he says, I'd love that. Yep. Steve, can you summarize your question? Uh, what were the knock-on effects, if you will, of the, uh, the event in the rest of the Caribbean? Did it provoke any reaction in uh, uh, other parts of the Caribbean that, uh, you know, sort of carry, uh, you know, sort of solidarity or that sort of thing? <clears throat> um, I really and truly cannot speak on that, but what I would have learned while doing my research in um, Barbados, Barbados would have had um, some influences here and there, which would also would have triggered their, their startup as it relates to um, the Black Power movement. But I also understood as well was that they were um, black power advocates um, were moving from island to island um, doing their speeches and so on so we had interactions between Grenada um, coming over um, those from Barbados coming over Payne and so on but 
to give you a, a definite response to say Grenada did this or Barbados did this, I am not I'm not in the position to do that. I mean, I guess the 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 book itself uh, covers the the huge uh, ramifications across a whole um, uh, geographical area of the Caribbean and and beyond and. Uh, uh, not only at the level of the social movements, or, you know, from below with the movements and the activists themselves, but also one of the questions that I want to ask, but I, I see there's two other hands up to, in relation to the kind of uh, transnational reaction at the level of the security and um, uh, intelligence uh, forces of the various states as well. Um, so uh, Naila Todd had your hand up first, so you want to go ahead? So yes, please. Yes. Are you hearing me now? Because yeah. I am having some connectivity difficulties as well. But are you hearing me? Hear you loud and clear. Yeah. Great, great, great. First of all, thank you for having this presentation. And I wish to thank Steve for that question. Because in Trinidad and Tobago, it was a very pivotal movement concerning the, the, the kind of circumstances that we were experiencing here in Trinidad, as most people will know, Black consciousness did not begin in the 70s. It has been happening over years. What happened here was a younger generation studying abroad who got themselves involved with Sir George Williams, and it added to that ferment excitement that was happening here in Trinidad with our own Black conscious movement. The Black power, which I would like to say was not a revolution. It was, an I would call it an uprising because it does not stand the scrutiny really of a revolution because of the history of Trinidad and Tobago, which that is another question. But of interest too, is the fact that it was a number of middle-class children. Well, I'm not gonna call her name now, but one of the protesters, her father happened to have been in the government, the then PNM government, and no less a person than Dr. Eric Williams, who was prime minister at the time, he is the person who got directly involved and helped to bring the students back home. What I would like to know, and this is a question I'm putting out there, to younger Trinidadian history scholars, they need to get into those documents and see precisely what was the role of Dr. Eric Williams in bringing the Trinidadian students back home? Now, when they came home, they became associated with the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. St. Augustine was in its very early stage of transitioning from what used to be the Imperial College of Tropical Agriculture into the humanities so that these, some of these students form some of the earliest students in those disciplines. And they were most influential in taking the king and the activities further. Thank you for that intervention. And yes, um, anyone in the panel want to respond to any specific points raised there? Maybe just to add to that. Um, so the chapter that I contributed to the book looked at the Abeng archives and Abeng was a, a, a publication uh, by young folks in Jamaica, um, you know, which covered um, some of the events that were going on in Montreal. 
um you know so so there were these you know and again you know like there is this tradition of alternative media um that emerges from you know black power where they were telling their own stories um and i think that's one side through which we can recuperate some of this but also to say that the folks who were part of the student union at UWE at Mona um, raised money uh, we're traveling from, uh, through different places uh, you know to talk about the protest in the aftermath um, so I mean I think the students at UWE um, were definitely in solidarity uh, with the students in Montreal um, both in ideological but also material terms um, you know in offering support uh, to them um, you know, and, and, and I think it's, you know, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting history to think about, you know, those, um, the, the history of student movements, um, and what they offer to this revisioning of, of, of the university. Thank you. Um, with a question from Spiros. Mm, hi, guys. I hope to hear me. Yeah, that's okay. Thanks a lot for the excellent delivers. Uh, if I'm not wrong, Malini said something about uh, the profits of the plantations so or the plantation profits and the universities. Uh, Malini, uh, I would like to know some things about this because uh, if I have understood you well, in my understanding, you meant that uh, they used the Anglo-Saxons used the profits of the plantations in order to, to, to establish uh, the universities, it has to do with the foundation of the universities. If this is true, this is very critical for me because in my understanding, this is the very heart of the, the British or the Anglo-Saxonic colonization because we know that the, the British and then the Anglo-Saxon used the, the universities as the big one for the domination of English language, which is the very the very heart of, of the Anglo-Saxonic or the Anglo-Saxon colonization for me, because let's say that the English language is the vehicle, <laughs> to put it that way, okay, of the colonization across the globe. So please let me know some things about this this is true or, or not they use the profits of the plantation in order to establish the universities this is my question and this is a topic also the answer is yes i think depending on the university that we're talking about so uh, the image that i showed was from mcgill university one of the uh, most well-known universities in Canada, and that was established through the profits of, that came from the transatlantic slave trade. Other universities in Canada also have um, similar histories. Um, Dalhousie, for example, um, even Concordia itself has a library named after the Grey Nuns, which um, the founder of the Grey Nuns uh, was also involved uh, in slavery. Uh, there's also um, in Canada, there's the Indigenous history as well. And uh, the most recent case we've had of a um, of a grappling with what this uh, settler colonial history means is uh, the university formerly known as Ryerson, um, which was started by Egbert Ryerson, who was one of the architects of the residential school system. Um, and during the pandemic, there were a number of uh, grave sites uh, discovered, um, uh, you know, that were the children who were sent, who were taken from their families and sent to residential schools. And that led to protests and the statue, the Ryerson statue being pulled down at that campus and the university's name being changed now to Toronto Metropolitan University. So, you know, there's been a number of social debates around, um, you know, the, the value systems within our universities um, in terms of the funding, the iconography, and so on. Yes. Um, yeah, and I would... mm -hmm. I would just add to that that um, this is this discussion of English as a um, 
and, and, and as the language of colonization and whatnot becomes especially fraught when we're talking about Quebec and the contemporary Quebec context where there's been a huge efforts, of course, to maintain the French language within Quebec, but where it would, uh, under our contemporary government, those are also being weaponized against immigrants, um, where the preservation of French as a language um, in opposition to English um, can also dovetail with some pretty virulent uh, xenophobia and efforts to crack down on immigration and make it harder to stay within Quebec and that, that those discourses have actually been targeting universities and colleges um, and that are in English as you know, these vehicles for assimilation. So just to make it a little bit more complicated in case it wasn't uh, complicated enough already. Thank you. And, and certainly the um, connections between money from slave trade and enslavement and British universities have been made very clear um, in the last decade or more of research. Um, <laughs> Personally, this is exactly the topic, Kate. This is exactly the topic, okay? You speak out the truth. We took the money from the slave, okay, from the slavery through plantations, and then we put it as an investment to the British or to the Anglo-Saxon universities. This is the heart of colonization for me. We are talking all the time about the decolonization of the education, okay? What is this exactly? for me is a decolonization of the English language because English language until today is the vehicle. So we have a new form of colonization, which is the neo-colonization through the domination of English language. And in this, okay, within this, okay, problem of problematic, we don't, we don't dare to take this topic or to bring it to the fore, okay? We are afraid to, to discuss about it. I don't know why. Sorry for this interruption, Kate. No, not at all, thank you. I mean, I think it's just an indication of just how, how rich the presentations have been, that it, that it, it brings up so many of these different issues that, uh, you know, this, this one student, and as you say, of course, non-student protest in Montreal in 1969, and the the way in which the the editors and the contributors have really demonstrated to us why this moment has so much for us to think about, not just as history, but the ongoing present and the futures that you, you um, hinted towards as well. Personally, I would love to continue this conversation for hours, um, uh, but we can't, I'm afraid. Uh, if we were um, back in our, uh, back in the olden days, we would be having this in person and, and being able to join uh, for a lovely glass of wine or juice afterwards to continue the dialogue. Um, we're in our online world now, but of course that means that we've been able to um, beam you in from Canada, from St. Vincent, and hopefully uh, all over the world tonight to listen to this fantastic um, panel who I want to thank very much and thank everyone for their questions and contributions. And just to say, um, um, we will continue our Caribbean seminar series in the next academic year. This is a, a great way to end the series. Um, everyone buy the book. And I just wanted, I, I mean, I can't say enough good things about it. And I, I one of the things, I guess, I, I love the, the sort of full circle that you brought it with publishing it with Black Rose Books. I meant to bring that up. It, I mean, that was just to me when I uh, when I saw that, I thought that's wonderful, and it, it made me feel very um, conflicted and guilty about publishing with the university press and all of those decisions that we make whenever we're thinking about where to place something. And I, I love that you went with um, Black Rose Press. So, uh, thanks again, everyone. Um, that was really, yeah, inspiring way to end our series. Great. Thank Very good. Yes. Thank you, Professor. Ronald, I just wanted to know, is the, where is the Abeng archive? Is it in the National Library in Jamaica? Uh, actually, it's available online. It's oh, online. Through the Digital Library of the Caribbean. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, right. You can find it through DLOC. Um, yeah, all yeah. the you know, uploaded there. Is, do you think there is a physical location? No. I, 
don't know. I mean, that might just be, you know, Rupert's basement. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, absolutely so, right. Yes, absolutely right. Some issues are in, in Senate House, but not a full uh, collection. So, yeah, the, the, you can get bits and pieces of the bang. But, yeah, as you say, you've got now a D-Lock having them all online and available to to. Wow. Mm, all is great. A, a great, um, yeah, initiative. Good. Great. Thank you all. Well, have a great day, everyone, uh, or evening, wherever you are. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Good to see you all. Thanks for having us. Um, it's really lovely to be able to share this space with everyone and um, 